Tonight we're continuing with our sermon series entitled Close Encounters. And we've been talking over the last several weeks and months about the glorious fact that no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, you can have a close encounter with God. The other morning I was praying, I said, Lord, I can't meet with President Donald Trump today, but I can meet with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords today. And what we've been doing is looking at the lives of the greats in the Word of God. We've considered Adam, who had the closest encounter with God ever, and how even when he failed, God continued to bless him. Adam, Abraham, Joseph, Moses, David, Daniel, all of these are archived on live stream and MP3. And I encourage you to listen to these messages on David and Daniel. Last week, we talked about the great prophet Isaiah, the Billy Graham of the Jewish nation. Tonight, we go into the New Testament. And we're going to do several in the New Testament. And we are, uh, one of my favorites, probably my most favorite, is the one we're going to do tonight and next Sunday night. Because we're going to be talking about the one person in all the Bible that I can really most identify with. And that is the big fisherman, Peter. The big fisherman. And that's what I want to talk to you tonight about. Close encounters, Peter, the big fisherman. Now you say, why do you call Peter the big fisherman? Well, I actually got it from a, a movie on, uh, in 1953, a movie called The Robe. I don't know if any of you have seen the uh, movie called The Robe. I always like to watch it around Easter. And in that movie, uh, the character of Peter had a code name because they had to have code names because of the persecution. And his code name was The Big Fisherman. So I want to talk to you tonight about The Big Fisherman. Let's stand tonight and, and see how we can have a close encounter with God. Luke chapter 6 verse 13 and then John chapter 6 verse 67 and if you're glad to be here say amen tonight amen. Luke chapter 6 verse 13 if you're there say amen. amen and when it was day he called unto his disciples and of them he chose 12 whom he named apostles Simon who he also named Peter. Please understand, Peter was not his original name. Simon was his original birth name. Simon Bar Jonah or Bar Jonas. Simon, the son of John or the son of Jonas. Bar just means son of. They didn't have last names like Ricky Nems. It was Simon, son of Jonah. Simon Bar Jonah. And so uh, please understand that Peter was a name that he gave to him. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now go to John chapter 6. Verses 67 through 69. John chapter 6, verses 67 through 69. If you're there, say amen. amen. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that you are the Christ the Son of the living God. Thank you tonight, Lord, for close encounters. Bless the reading of your scripture. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. amen. And turn around and tell somebody you're glad to see them tonight as you're being seated. Glad to see you tonight. <clears throat> In the last day's newsletter that used to be published many years ago, Leonard Ravenhill, the great revivalist, tells a group of tourists uh, visiting a picturesque village who just happened to walk by an old man sitting beside a fence. In a rather patronizing way, one of the tourists said, Sir, were any great people born in this village? Thinking that he would surely know he was aged and perhaps knew all of the generations of that small village they were getting ready to tour. Sir, were any great people born in that village? The old man wisely responded, No, no. Only babies. <laughs> you see how true it is that God takes ordinary people, oh, yes, only babies, to make them what they can and should be for his almighty power. And of all the disciples, Peter is the most accurate mosaic of each of us here this evening. John MacArthur points out in his book to 12 ordinary men, Interestingly, that Peter's name is mentioned in the Gospels more than any other name than Jesus himself. 
No one speaks as often as Peter. And no one is spoken to by the Lord as often as Peter. No disciple is so frequently rebuked by the Lord as Peter. But yet no disciple ever rebukes the Lord but Peter. <laughs> think about that. He's the only disciple that we have on record that he rebuked the Lord. Now think about that. No one else confessed Christ more boldly or acknowledged his lordship more explicitly. Yet no other disciple ever verbally denied Jesus as forcefully, as publicly as Jesus did. Fumbling, bumbling, all the mistakes, making bold statements he didn't back up, putting his foot in his mouth, even making a big mistake not only before Pentecost, but some people fail to remember he made a mistake after Pentecost. That's right. Most people know of his big mistakes before Pentecost. But they forget that the Apostle Paul had to confront Peter in Galatians chapter 2 about a wrong he was doing. And I don't have time to explain the wrong that he was in. But this was when Peter, many years, should have been older and was older and should have been a little bit more wise. And, and this was after Pentecost, which lets me know that, that no matter how old you are, no matter how spiritual you are, no matter how used of God you are, we are still only babies. And we are all susceptible to make mistakes. We're not got gold dust breathing just yet. Uh, we're not spreading on the streets of gold. Uh, last I checked, they were asphalt from here to my house. Uh, we are still very much a work in progress. When I'm 85, when I'm 55, when I was only five, uh, he is still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Somebody say amen tonight. And yet with all of these things, all of the mistakes he made, all the times he put his foot in his mouth, all of the times uh, he missed it, he is still the only disciple that walked on water. <laughs> he is still the one disciple that preached uh, and brought Pentecost in to this world. And 3,000 were saved in his message. Uh, he is still the one we read uh, that just the shadow of peace, Peter passing by, people were healed uh, because of the power in his life. Uh, he had close encounters with God. Uh, and if he, the fumbling, bumbling disciple uh, who messed up so many times, uh, if he could still be used of God, brother and sister I'm glad tonight to know that I can be used of God that he ain't finished with me yet that he's the potter and I am the clay and I don't know about you I want to have close encounters with God and put aside my mistakes and put us yes we repent yes we ask God to forgive us but once it happens you can still have close encounters with the Lord somebody shout hallelujah tonight go ahead and give him a hand of praise tonight now, I want to give you five things about Peter, three tonight, two next Sunday night. I'm going to talk to you about his conversion, his courage, his confession, and next Sunday night, his crash and his comeback. Oh, you want to be here next Sunday night. Amen. I believe I'm preaching next Sunday night or whenever I'm preaching again on Sunday night. So first of all, let's talk about Peter's conversion. Peter's conversion. If you go to John chapter 1, verse 40. So how did Peter get saved? How did he get saved? Well, understand about Peter that when Jesus met Peter, Peter was already an accomplished man. He was already, when he met the Lord, he was already a homeowner. For the scripture speaks of Simon's house in three places, Mark 1, 29, Luke 4, 38, and Acts chapter 10, verse 17. And to have a home in that day was, was not the average. So he was an established man. He had, a, he had his own home. Uh, he was married. Uh, for there's reference to Jesus healing Simon's mother-in-law uh, in Luke chapter 4, verse 38. And you can't have a mother-in-law if you don't have a wife. Uh, and also 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5. The apostle Paul talks about Peter's wife. Uh, he, was, he was married. He had a home. And uh, he was a business owner. Uh, it says in Luke chapter 5, verse 3, uh, uh, one of the boats, which was Simon's. So here was an accomplished man in his life. He was a man that uh, had a business. He was in partnership with other men. Uh, he uh, absolutely knew his way around. He was a man of authority. He was a man whom, but yet he was a man whom the master called. And so Peter's conversion, God got a hold of his heart and, and God did something. And here's how it started. Go to John chapter 1 verses 40 through 42. 
do? How did Peter get converted? What was it that led him to meet the master? In John chapter 1 verse 40, it says one of the two, if you're there, say amen. And one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew. Somebody say Andrew. Now who was Andrew? He was Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and said unto him, we have found the Messiah, which being interpreted as Christ. Now look at verse 42. And he brought him to Jesus. So here's how Peter got converted. It was because Andrew, his brother, got converted, had met the Lord. And he went to his brother Simon and said, I have found the Messiah. And he took Peter to meet the Lord. In other words, it all started with Andrew bringing him to Jesus. Now, I got a question for you tonight. What if Andrew had not brought him to Jesus? What if Andrew was just content that, well, I'm saved and praise God, I don't know about my old brother. You know, he's a cussing fisherman and, you know, he's going to be hard to reach. And what if Andrew had taken that uh, mentality? What if Andrew, even worse, what if he didn't care? My friend, do we care about our brothers? Do we care about our sisters? Do we care about our children? Do we care about our grandchildren? I want you to know Easter Sunday is coming. Let's fill the house. Let's invite our friends and family. Let's give them a reason to be here. Let's let them know that we're inviting and we're concerned. Let's bring our family to Jesus. Oh, my friend, if Andrew had not brought Peter, we might not would have had Pentecost like it was we might not would have had two books in the New Testament first and second Peter we might not ever had a record of what God can do with a person despite their problems thank the Lord Andrew brought his brother to Jesus somebody shout amen shouldn't we bring people to Jesus shouldn't we be concerned shouldn't we tell somebody somewhere somehow I have found the Messiah has anybody found the Messiah if you have found the Messiah bring somebody to him. Somebody shout amen. amen. Now go to what happened. John chapter 1 verse 42. And he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus beheld him. And said thou art Simon. I want you to know God knows exactly who you are. You were born a baby. I said there was only babies right. He knows every baby. He knows that little baby that Samantha has uh, this morning and tonight. God has an ultimate awesome plan. And that baby has been brought into the fellowship of Westmoreland Church. Because she is bringing that baby to the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. He said, you are Simon, but you will be called Cephas. Which is the translation of the word Peter. Which by interp interpretation means, a, somebody say a stone. Oh, you're not saying that loud enough. Somebody say stone. Amen. <laughs> All right. So Simon, Simon, he's, that, that's his birth name. Uh, but Peter is his Christian God-given name. Uh, and really it was, uh, really the word uh, stone there in the, in, the, in the Greek means Petra. Uh, Petra means a stone. And so that's where we get the word Peter from, Petra. And so, so Jesus is saying, uh, you're, you're Simon. Uh, and I recognize you've got your faults. I recognize you're a strong man, strong-minded man. I recognize you'll be high-maintenance. Has anybody got high maintenance children? Has anybody, anybody got high maintenance uh, 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 family? Come on now. And you ask a group of pastors, have you got high maintenance members? Oh, let me not say anything right there. But listen, uh, Jesus said you're Simon, but that's who you are. But that's not who you're going to be. Because when I get through with you, you're going to be a rock. You're going to be solid. You're going to be a, a firm foundation. It's not what you will be, but thou shalt be. Thou shalt be. Thou shalt be. And I'm so glad God doesn't see me for my struggles, my mistakes, my failures. But he looks at me and says, one day you will be. You are a sinner, but you will be a saint. You were a loser, but you will be a winner. You were broke, but now you're going to be blessed. 
and highly favored of God. You were sick, but now you're going to be healed. God takes us just as we are, but he doesn't leave us like we are. He is on the throne, and he can change you, and he can, drugs can't change you. And a marital, uh, uh, getting a relationship, a divorce, that won't ever change you. But there's one who will change you, uh, and he will change you not only from, the, from being converted to being saved, but he'll change you day by day and break, make you a brand new person. Can you say amen? amen? Has anybody been changed by the Lord? Oh, before you got saved, oh, you were something else. But tonight, uh, you're in the house of the Lord, uh, and you're lifting your hands up to the Savior. He saved you. He took you as you are, and he's still working on you to make you what you ought to be. Amen? Thank God that Andrew brought his brother to Jesus. And thank God Jesus took him as he was and told him what he was going to be. And you know what? We'll still be working on that in eternity. Oh, he's going to be conforming me to the image of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen tonight? And not only do we see Peter's conversion, but number two, let's consider Peter's courage. Peter was a very courageous man. You know, if there's ever a time for us to be courageous, it is is now. Peter just didn't seem to be afraid of anything. And isn't that the way it ought to be for us? The Bible says four different times, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. And the final time, the just shall live by his faith. So please understand that the just does not live by fear. The just, just does not live by the forecast. The just lives by what? And I'll tell you, Peter exemplified that. He is the only person that it's ever recorded humanly to do something called walk on water. I didn't say walk in water. Brother Ricky, do you really believe the miracles of the Bible? Surely that's, that's a little uh, addition of some human author. Let me tell you something. I be, you know when the miracles of the Bible started? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God. Once you believe that, that's the mir amen, that miracle. Because once you believe in God, then you'd have no problem with the miracles. Can you say amen tonight? Look at Matthew chapter 14, verse 28 through 29. If you're there, say amen. If you see it, say amen. amen. And Peter answered and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And Jesus said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go see Jesus. Now, brother, that took courage. Now, I don't know if any of you have been out on a boat far from the shore around deep water, the last thing you want to do is get yourself out of that boat. That's the last thing you want to, unless you're scuba diving. And even then, you're really prepared for it. you got to put yourself in that moment. First of all, Jesus is walking on the water. How many of you know Jesus can walk on the water? I'll tell you, no matter where you are in the middle of the sea, in the middle of the desert, he can come walking to where you are. He is omnipresent. He is there. Where there shall you go from his spirit, and where can you flee from his presence? Uh, they were in the boat. Uh, storms had come up, uh, but the same waves that were rocking that boat uh, were bringing the Lord Jesus one step at a time. You may be in a boat. You may be lost. You may be out there like Gilligan's Island. Come on now. You may they feel like you're not going to be able to find the shore, but Jesus knows where to find you. Can you say amen tonight? And Peter looks and says, if it's you, let me get out of this boat. Kind of reminds me of a story of the man that was walking a tightrope across the Niagara Falls. They had a tightrope and he took a wheelbarrow and he walked it all the way across so he had the wheelbarrow, and there's the Niagara Falls, and the crowds were cheering, and 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 uh, and they were just so amazed at at, at at the danger, and and here he is with this wheelbarrow, and and he got he he walked that way, he came back. And he looked to the crowd. He said, do you think I can do it again? And they were like, oh, yeah, you can do it again. You can do it again. And then he looked. He said, okay, who wants to ride in the wheelbarrow? Nobody took him up on it. Come on now. <laughs> I mean, it takes courage to walk on the water. And I know 
that he sank. I know that he got his eyes off the Lord and he began to sink. And we always look at the negative. That's just how we are. But my friend, God sometimes wants us to get out of our boat. God sometimes wants to do the impossible. God sometimes, if we just stay in, if we just keep doing what we've done, we're going to get what we've always got. It takes R-I-S-K. He is there. If he's calling you to start a business, uh, if he's calling you to witness to a specific one, I don't care how hard they are. If he's calling you to do something that, that just doesn't seem like, it's going to take some courage. I'm here tonight to tell you, step out of the boat, step out of the confines, move on out to what God has called you to do. Oh, you may sink a time or two, but guess what? He didn't sink very deep, did he? Jesus was there and picked him right back up and they got back to the boat together. I want you to know, have I got anybody with courage here tonight to, to say I'm going to go all the way? I like this phrase, sink or swim. I'm going all the way for Jesus. And you know you're not going to sink if you're with the master of the waves. Can you shout hallelujah tonight? And not only did he have courage to walk on the water, he was a fighting man. I'm telling you what, you didn't want to meet Peter in the back alley and get on his bad side. I'll tell you that. He, in fact, I thought about uh, Brother Philip, that, that word rock, you know, I thought about Rocky, the movie. Dun, 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 dun. I mean, my imagination just hits that way. I'm thinking, of Peter, buddy, he was a rocky, you know. No, Jesus called him that for a reason. You know why I say that? Because do you remember the night that Jesus was being arrested? Look at John chapter 18 and verse 10. Woo, I'm about to shout. Hallelujah. Get ready. Clear the aisle. I'm about to take off here just a minute. Because I want to cut the ear off of some demon. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I hate the devil. Like Billy Sunday. I'm going to bite him. I'm going to hit him. And, and, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butt him with my head. I'm going to do everything I can. And if I don't have any teeth in my mouth. Uh, and I can't bite him. I'll gum him to death. Hallelujah. And I'm telling you old Peter was courageous. Look. John chapter 18 and verse 10. And then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest servant and did what? Cut off his right ear. You talk about courage. I mean, he cut the soldier's ears off. And understand that that was a death penalty. If he had been, he could have been arrested and he could have been crucified with the Lord. But in that moment, courage rose up within him and he cut that ear off. And I am telling you, we have, and I know the story and this, that, and that, but we have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God and we need to start we need to be like Peter we don't need to let it sit we don't need now I know he probably shouldn't have done it and please I'm just trying to give you some additional thoughts here maybe you hadn't thought of it like this and this is kind of fresh it's what I like fresh to me glory to God but listen just just understand he had a sword and he used it you've got a sword and you never use it Praise God for Skylar and Julie. Well, I'm going to tell you when they hit tragedy, I know they pulled out that sword. And I know they cut some ears and some necks of some demons and said, you're not having Skylar. I, co I come against that in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We need to pull out our sword and take courage. We stand on the word of God. Not my, I cut the sword. I cut the ear off of feelings. I cut the ear off of fear. I cut the ear off of some backbiter. I cut the ear off of some uh, pet. I'm telling you, I'm here for God, and God is going to do something amazing, and he's on the throne, and he is up to something, and I'm going to take courage, and I'm going to pull out my sword, and here we go. Come on, give him a hand of praise tonight. Pull out that sword. Now, we know that Jesus took the ear, and he healed it. And that's a, that's a, that's, that's amazing. That man's ear that was healed. Well, can you imagine that man? One minute your ears off, the next minute it's perfectly fine. Ain't that what the Lord can do? I'm gonna tell you. This is another sermon. This is another sermon. If you've been whacked and your ear has been cut off and you're bleeding, I'll tell you the Lord can touch you, and He can reverse the curse, and He can bring grace and compassion. Now, what we don't understand is he was bold enough and courageous enough to cut off the servant's ear. And something happened 
and caused fear to come into his heart because a little bit later he denies the Lord. That's next week's sermon. But for that moment, he cut the man's ear off and he was courageous. And then in Acts chapter 9, there's another example of his courage. And I'm not going to tell you, and I'm going to read the scripture to you. But in Acts chapter 9, uh, Peter was a Jew and Pentecost and many nationalities received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But the Jews were kind of sitting on it. And Peter had a vision. Somebody say a vision. Our pastor preached on it a few weeks ago while he was fasting and praying. And God showed him a Gentile by the name of Cornelius. And in that vision, Jesus or God said, Peter, all, this, all these animals, he said, rise, kill, and eat. And Peter said, Lord, I've never had anything unclean. Some of these animals were Jewish, ceremonially unclean. And then God said, what I've called clean, don't you call unclean. If I tell you to eat it, eat it. And then he got the message. He said, go to those Gentiles. But Lord, they're unclean. They're heathen. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's why we have the Holy Ghost. It's to go out to the heathen and to go out to the lost. And I'll tell you that Peter was very courageous. When he left his Jewish brothers and sisters and said, I've got a mission. And he went down there to Cornelius and he said, I, I would not even have come here because I, as a Jew, am not supposed to go. Don't you hate uh, racism? Come on now. I know I'm, I was born and raised in North Carolina. I was, I'm a Southern boy. I know the racism that, that was a struggle of my generation and the generation before me. I remember a day when people would make statements like this. I remember good people made statements like this. I can t I could tell you some of their names and it would shock you. But they, they were sincere. But they were bad wrong. But I remember they would make statements. Well I don't believe the blacks and the whites ought to worship together. The blacks ought to have their church. They're Christians. But we ought to have our church. I can hear that. I remember hearing that as a little boy. And I remember some over the years that as I pastored that we would begin to get African Americans to come in and different races, Hispanics to come in. And some of the some of the men who had teenage daughters and they were like, well, I don't like this and I don't like that. And, and, and I, I understand what race, but racism is terrible. Racism is horrible. Brother and sister, God, if you are if you are a human being. And God is your Savior. We are brothers and sisters in the Lord. And quite frankly, if you can't worship with black people or Hispanic people or with white people, then what are you going to do in glory? There's no segregation in glory. There's not the black section over here and the white section over there. You might as well get used to it. And Peter was very courageous. Oh, thank God. Thank God that... There's people who in here who are not willing, who are not afraid to launch out into the deep, not afraid to get out of the boat, not afraid to start your business, not afraid to 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 cross the color line, not afraid to tell everybody anywhere that Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm gonna just tell you, Peter was not afraid. Oh God, thank God that he listen. If he had not gone to Cornelius, if he had not gone to the Gentiles, guess what? Guess what you are? You're a Gentile. Did you know that? Now you might be a white Gentile. You might be a black Gentile. But you're a Gentile. And I'm so glad to know that those Jewish, those Jewish men responded to the Lord. Uh, and went out and were courageous. Uh, and brother and sister, we have to be courageous uh, in a day of racism. We have to say that our church, Westmoreland Church, uh, is a church uh, for all races. Uh, for all people. Uh, he died for the whole world. Uh, somebody shout Amen. <laughs> Have not I commanded thee? Be thou strong and of good courage, and be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee wherever thou goest. Somebody needs to have courage against cancer. Somebody needs to have courage against disease. Somebody needs to have courage against racism. Somebody needs to have courage to get out of the boat and go to where God has called you to go. Well, I've been in this boat a long time. Yeah, I can tell too. Amen. Do you know if you stay in a boat for a long time, you begin to look bad? You do? Oh, it's time to move on out. 
And the Lord is calling you. Have you got courage to do it? Just lift your hands and say, here am I, Lord. Here am I, Lord. I'm going to wield the sword of the Spirit. <clears throat> Thank God for Peter's courage. Thank God for his conversion. And then lastly tonight, Peter's confession. Somebody say, Peter's confession. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, some Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom do you say that I am? Verse 16. And Simon Peter answered, the first one to answer, and said, Thou art the Christ. The son of the living God. Verse 17. And Jesus answered and said. Blessed are you Simon Barjona. There he is Simon son of Jonah. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. But my father which is in heaven. Peter's confession. Thou art the Christ. The son of the living God. Is that your confession tonight? Listen. The context. The context. Where were, were they? Go to verse 13. They were in a place called Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi. Or uh, Philippi of Caesar. Now, if you'll go back and study, there were 14 temples to 14 different gods in Caesarea Philippi. Um, not only were there 14 temples to 14 different gods, but there was also... Uh, Caesarea Philippi was the main, in that region, one of the main areas for Caesar worship. That means that the Caesar, who was in control over the Roman Empire, at that time, was they began to worship him as a human god. So get the picture here. Fourteen different gods, and the whole city is named after Caesar, Caesarea, to Caesar, to worship him as God. And so Jesus comes up and said, hey, with all these gods around here... Who do you think I am? That's the context. Now look at the claims. Well, some say you're John the Baptist. Okay. Some say you're Elijah. We can understand that. Elijah, the end of the Old Testament, he said he's going to send Elijah back. Maybe this is Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah. Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. And we know that Jesus wept over Jerusalem. And this is really one that bothers me. Or one of the prophets. That's not very flattering in my opinion. Because Jesus had done so much in miracles by this time. He had already done Lazarus from four days. He had already raised the widow woman. So he had already did many more miracles. Feeding, feeding the 5,000 and the 10,000. And not only was his miracles, but his message. Never a man spake like this man. How dare they come up and say, well, he's just one of the prophets. That was really not a compliment. That was a derision. They were rejecting him. They were rejecting his message and the obvious proof of his miracles. And you know, ladies and gentlemen, today that that's what people, they don't get mad with you as long as you talk about God. And they don't get mad with you if you say that there are many ways to God. Well, what's good for you is good for me. But the minute you tell them that there's only one way to God, there's only one path to the Father, and it's not through Mohammed, it's not through Baal, it's not through Buddha. The minute you say there is only one path to God, Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, the Son of the living God, brother, the battle is on. But let it forever go to the confession. Matthew chapter 16. No, you're not just one of the prophets. And that's what they like to tell people. They say, have you heard people say, well, we believe Jesus was a good man. And he was a prophet. Even Islam says that they recognize he was a prophet. But my friend Josh McDowell tells us that Jesus is one of three things. He's either, he's either a liar, an outright liar, because he said he was the son of God. He plainly said, before Abraham was, I was. Before he, he even went so far to say, I and my father are one, are equal. Making himself equal with God. So if he was not that, then he was outright lying. So he's either a liar or he's a lunatic. 
Maybe he thought, you know, we get delusional people sometime. David Koresh, you know, the silly guy, one of the, uh, out in Waco, Texas. And then the guy that wanted to meet the Hellbop Comet about 20 years ago with the bald head and the glassy eyes. And he got all those people to commit suicide. And Jim Jones, uh, you know, we have a lot of people who, who say they're the Lord and say it, but they're just lunatics. And so they think either, uh, or maybe he really thought he was, but he, you know, he really wasn't. So listen, he's either lying or he's either a lunatic. Or he's got to be the Lord of glory. And I want you to know how he proved to be the Lord of glory. He didn't just heal the sick. He didn't just say, I'm the son of God. Uh, he died. But on the third day, he rose from the dead. Uh, and by the resurrection of the son of God, he lives. He lives forever. He lives. Uh, and he is the son. He's not just one of the prophets. Uh, he's the only way to God. Uh, he's the only prophet that will tell you how to be saved uh, and how to make it to heaven. Uh, is anybody here tonight going to make a confession? that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Aren't you glad he is? He was Peter's Lord. Say amen. Aren't you glad he's your pastor's Lord? Say amen. Aren't you glad he's your Lord? Can you say amen? Why don't you give him a hand? Why don't you make a confession? Oh, Simon Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you. And I say unto thee, you are Peter. And upon this rock I will build my and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys to the kingdom. And whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I will tell you, that's a confession that brings possession. And here's a man that was a failure at times. Here's a man that missed it. But I'll tell you what, he got it right. And you may miss it a lot of times. And you will miss it going forward. You can't help but you're human. You're clay. But if you'll get this thing right, if you'll get that confession right, I promise you the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. He said, I will build my church. Say that with me. I will build my church. Say it again. I will build my church. By the way, we, we, if we're building the church, we're doing exactly what we're supposed to be doing. Oh, brother Ricky, I've got, I've got so many commitments and so many obligations. I've got a house up in the mountains. I've got a cottage by the beach. And you know, I've worked for 55 years, and I'm just going to take it easy. I don't see anywhere in Scripture that comes close to, to what we're supposed to be doing. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with rest, relaxation, and enjoyment. And I'm not saying it's not wrong to have a cottage at the mountains or a place at the beach. Uh, that's no problem whatsoever. The problem comes in, you've got to be somewhere in church. And the church cannot be built without committed people. And let me explain to you what commitment is. Commitment is you're faithful in attendance as much as possible. You're faithful in serving in whatever capacity that we need you in. And you're faithful in financial giving. And my friend, if church... church Churches like ours, if as we begin, if we begin to fail and our members become uncommitted and our finances begin to go down uh, one by one, lights all across America, churches will be closing while people are at the mountains and at the beach. And guess who's rising while the church is declining? The homosexual gay agenda, the left, uh, all of those crazy politicians, uh, they're gaining steam while we're up at the mountains and down at the coast. Now, I'm just doing some old holiness preaching right now, and, uh, and, it, and I'm just being very courageous. I'm about to cut some ears off right now. Amen? Not yours. Others, right? But listen, we've got to build his church. I am all in for Westmoreland. Amen? I am all in. A double L I N. This is the place God has placed me for this season. I want to build it. I want to stand behind our pastor and I want to say whatever I can do and whatever my wife can do, we're going to be with you. We're going to strengthen his hand in the Lord. We're going to come together with leadership, with worship, with praise. And I just believe with the bottom of my heart that the glory of the latter house is greater than that of the former house. And I don't believe it's going to be too many days ere the Lord pours out his spirit. And we're going to, I read in my devotional time this morning that the Lord will do one 
wonders among you. I'm ready for the Lord to do wonders among this house. I will build my church. This is my church, and I'm going to join in with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Yes, I'm going to make mistakes. No, I'm not going to be perfect, but I'm going to be what God calls me to be and what He will empower me to be. And I'm going. Are y'all listening to me out there? How many, of you are in, how many of you are interested in building what God is building? If you are, give him a hand of praise. Do it in the name of Jesus. And I'm closing. If you'll come on up to the piano, uh, Brother Wilson, and thank you, and Sister Bridget, and Brother Tom. Uh, let me close with the confession. John chapter 6, verse 67. John chapter 6, verse 67. Here's another confession. Jesus said unto the twelve, Will you go away? And Simon Peter said, Lord, do y'all see that up there? To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Remember that Simon Peter was an accomplished businessman, had a family, had his own home. And people were forsaking the Lord. And Jesus looked to Peter and others and said, will you go away? Do you know that we can choose to stray from the Lord? Do you know that every day we have to keep ourselves focused? Because if not, we can drift. If not, we can, we can, something can hurt us. Maybe there's a death of a precious loved one. Maybe there's a diagnosis, maybe something. And we turn away from the Lord. We've seen people go away, haven't we? Oh, my friend, it's called backsliding. You know, you know, and I know people who used to serve the Lord. And, and, and when things got tough, they went away. But the question tonight is, will you go away? Well, you don't know what I've been hurt. You don't know what I've been, been through. I said, will you go away? How can you go away from Jesus? He didn't say he would get us out of trouble. He never promised there wouldn't be any trouble. But I promise you this. He may not get you out of trouble. But if you'll stay with him, he'll be in trouble with you. That's right. Brother Ray, is he in trouble with you back there? Is he walking with you through that journey? For better, for worse. In sickness and in health. And here's a man of God that his wife is... Dealing with that terrible disease. And we curse that in the name of Jesus. But he's here every service. Because he will not go away. Oh I'm so thankful. That the Lord. That the Lord has mercy on us when we stray. Amen. Amen. Now I will tell you this. Next week we're going to find. He did stray. His faith did get weak. And you're going to read about that next Sunday. So please understand, there are times when I did stray from the Lord. Times my heart got hard and my heart got heavy. But how many of you want to make a fresh confession tonight? Lord, I will not go away. No matter what faces tomorrow. With your grace and with your strength, where can I go? You have the words of eternal life. Would you stand with me tonight? Jim Elliott said, Jim Elliott said, he... You know who Jim Elliott was. Jim Elliott was one of those missionaries that went down to South America. And when he got off the plane and began to minister to those savages, he was killed and several others. But he made this statement. And that, those same savages today are great Christians. But through his blood. But he made this statement. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Give what you cannot keep. To gain what you cannot lose. Will you make a confession tonight? Do you want a close encounter tonight? Do you need to get out of the boat tonight? Do you need to take courage tonight to what God has called you to do? If so, would you stand? Would you come out of your seat and join us as they sing tonight? Father, we want to have close encounters tonight. God, give us the courage to take the sword of the Spirit. Amen and amen. Go ahead. Come on, join me at the front tonight. Let's close in prayer tonight.
salvation tonight. Make it to the Lord afresh. I will not go away. I will not leave you. Lord, I will follow you. Close encounters. Close encounters, Lord. Oh, God, I'm going to step out of the boat tonight. I'm going to step out of the boat. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Get my brother close encounters. Lord, he's been through some trials. He's made a confession. I will follow the Lord. I will step out of the boat. I will pick up the sword. I will have close encounters. I'll give up everything to gain everything. I'll give up anything to gain everything. I surrender. God, you're going to deliver. You're going to set free. Spirit, you are healed.